Welcome back to Measure Theory. This is part two today and we still have to talk a little bit about sigma algebras. Here you can see the definition from last time. In short, maybe a sigma algebra is just a family of subsets of a given set X, which fulfills these three rules. Which means the empty set and the full set is always in the sigma algebra and for each set also the complement is in the sigma algebra. And the third rule says that we can form arbitrarily countable unions inside the sigma algebra. And all sets that are elements in the sigma algebra are just called measurable sets. Okay, that's good enough for a short recap. And now I can tell you it's easy to show the following. Imagine you have a lot of different sigma algebras on a given set X. Let's call them AI, where I comes from an arbitrary index set. Here it does not matter if the index set is countable or not. What we can do then is look at all the intersections of these sigma algebras. This is written in the following way, so this big cap where we go over the index set and form the intersection. Now as I said, this is easy to show and I advise you yeah, to try it that this indeed gives you again a sigma algebra. So it does not matter if you just look at the intersection of two sigma algebras or of the intersection of a lot of sigma algebras, you still get the result that you get a new, yeah, smaller sigma algebra on our set X. This result is very helpful if you want to have a lot of properties that your measurable sets should have. Then you can just put the properties in different AIs and then just yeah, form the union to get out a sigma algebra where all your measurable sets have all the properties. In short, this result helps you a lot if you want to define a suitable sigma algebra for your problem. And this gives rise to the next definition. For this, let's fix a family of subsets. Yeah, so we have a subset of the power set of a given set. In other words, just a collection of some subsets, which means they don't have to form a sigma algebra yet. However, the result is now that we can form a sigma algebra out of this M. And we can choose the smallest sigma algebra, and smallest just means with respect to the set inclusion, that contains the set M. The interesting thing is that we immediately know how to form such a smaller sigma algebra. Yeah, we just look at the intersection again. There we just put in sigma algebras A, where we know that our sigma algebra has to be bigger than our set M. Still keep in mind that we are working inside the power set, so we're working with sets of subsets. That could be confusing, but it doesn't matter in our whole set con construction here. Yeah, and keep in mind, our A has to be sigma algebras. So we're putting in sigma algebras and use the intersection, so we know something comes out and it's still a sigma algebra. Yeah, and because it's intersection, yeah, it's the smallest sigma algebra with this property. Yeah, so the smallest one that contains M. However, you see this is a long term to write down, therefore the common notation one uses is just a sigma of this set M as the definition of this intersection. Another name for this sigma algebra is often the sigma algebra that is generated by M. Keep in mind, it is no problem to find a sigma algebra that contains M. You can just use the power set if you want. The real question is therefore to find yeah, the most efficient sigma algebra. So where you have to add the least amount of sets to get to a sigma algebra. Yeah, and this is indeed the sigma M. To get used to this definition, let's look at an easy example. Let's look at a set with four elements. So let's call them A, B, C, and D. And then we define yeah, a set of subsets. So maybe I just choose singletons. So this is just the subset that contains 
only A and this is just a subset that contains only B and I form the whole set. So this is my family of subsets. First thing to note, this is not a sigma algebra yet. So we can form now our sigma of M, which should be the smallest sigma algebra that contains this family of subsets. We immediately know two things. First of all, we know it's a sigma algebra. So we know it contains the empty set and the whole set X. This is the first property of a sigma algebra. The next thing we know is that it's a sigma algebra that contains our set M. Uh, so therefore also A as a set and B as a set has to be inside sigma M. Now, if you think about the other properties of the sigma algebra, we remember that we know that all the unions, countable unions, yeah, are inside the sigma algebra. Yeah, and countable union is, of course, the union of these two sets. So we know also A, B has to be inside the sigma algebra. All other unions we can form with these four sets yeah, don't change anything. Yeah, we still get out to X or the empty set or A or B. So these are all the unions we can form out of these four sets. Then let's go to the one remaining property of a sigma algebra, namely that all the complements are also inside. Which means here the complement of A is of course B, C, D has also be inside the sigma algebra. And the complement of B is of course A, C, D. And then we also have to add the complement of A, B, which is C, D. Every step we did up to this point were things we needed to do to reach a sigma algebra. So there was no other choice than adding all these elements here. The question still remains, was this sufficient? So did we get to a sigma algebra yet? This is what we can now immediately check. So for example, the first rule is fulfilled. Empty set and X are inside. All complements are inside. So if we look at complements here and here, we still see all are there. Okay, then what about the unions? So we know the union here and here, everything fits together. What about the unions here? So just check all possible unions and then you see hmm, all the sets are there. We need to be stable under the operations of union and complements. So this means what we have here is indeed a sigma algebra. And by construction, it was the smallest one possible to get from M to a sigma algebra. So this is indeed sigma M. So what you saw here was that it's not so hard to get to the sigma algebra if we start with a finite set. Yeah, so if you have finitely many elements, we can do all the finitely many operations to end at our sigma algebra in the end. Obviously, this has to be much harder if we start with an infinite set, because then we have to do infinitely many steps until we reach the sigma algebra. And this leads us now to the most important sigma algebra, and I will define it here. This works if our set X is a topological space. If you don't know what a topological space is, you can work in the same way if your X is a metric space. If you also don't know what a metric space is, then you can choose X more concretely as R or Rn if you want. These things work all the same because the only ingredient we need here is to know what open sets are. Now you might know what we want to do. We want to have all these open sets in our sigma algebra, which means we will look at the sigma algebra that the open sets generate. And indeed, this is the Borel sigma algebra denoted by B of X. This is the sigma algebra generated by the open sets. If you are working in a topological space, normally you would say, okay, I have my set X together with the topology. Yeah, so this could be my T and call this a topological space. And the topology are just the open sets, yeah, which means by our definition from above, our Borel sigma algebra is nothing more than sigma of this topology. 
And this is the Boel Sigma algebra. Maybe to be more concrete, it's the Boel Sigma algebra on X. What you should note is that in our notation, the topology vanishes. So there's no mention of the topology inside this Bx because most of the time the topology is clear. It is obvious which topology or metric we use. For example, in Rn we use our standard topology so we know what the open sets in Rn are and therefore we immediately know what the Borel sigma algebra of Rn is. Therefore you really should keep in mind that by definition of the Borel sigma algebra it includes the topological structure, so what open means, into a sigma algebra. And in the case of Rn, this is indeed a really big sigma algebra, but it's not a power set. So it's not the biggest possible sigma algebra, but it's the most suitable sigma algebra in our context. Because it contains all the sets we want to measure. And this is what we will do in the next video, where I want to define what a measure is. And there you will see that in the case of Rn, we need this Borel sigma algebra and can't choose the power set because our measure should fulfill some yeah, meaningful rules. And these rules can't be fulfilled on the whole power set, but on the Borel sigma algebra. And the Borel sigma algebra is big enough. There are a lot of sets inside and indeed all the sets are inside we want to measure in the end. Then thank you very much and see you next time.